In question one, we had to multiply a matrix. So in case you don't know how, when you're multiplying a matrix, what you do is you take the first matrix and the second matrix. So this is calculate A, B. So I have A and then B. And the order does matter, as we'll see later in this question. And basically, you're going to look at the rows of the first matrix. So for example, if I take the first row of the first matrix, the top row, and then in the second matrix, you're going to look at the columns. So if we look at the first column in the next matrix, then where they intersect is going to be what entry you get. So here we have the top row and the far left column. Where they intersect is this top left here, because they both contain that. So that's the entry that we're going to get by multiplying these together. And basically what we do is we just multiply each bit together. So for example, we multiply the minus one by the zero, so the first in each, which gives us zero, then we add them all together. So you do minus one times zero, which is zero, plus zero times three, which is zero, plus two times one, which is two. Now, if we want to do the top middle entry, we basically move the, we're going to look at, still be looking at the top row, but now we're going to be looking at the middle column. And then we just do the same thing. Minus one times one is minus one. I'll just do this up here and then I'll delete it every time just so that I'm not like taking up too much space. So minus one times one is minus one. Zero times minus two is zero. And then two by four is eight. So we'll have minus one plus eight, which is seven. Let me just get rid of that. And then we'll move on to the final one. So now we're looking at top row, far right. So it's going to give us top right. Minus one times two is minus two. Zero times zero, zero. Two times zero, zero. So we're just going to get minus two. Now we're going to move down to the middle row and we'll just start off on the left again. So we'll have four times zero, which is zero. Minus three times three, which is minus nine. Then zero times one, which is zero. So we'll just have minus nine. Move over to the middle column. 4 times 1, 4, minus 3 times minus 2 is 6, so that's 10 in total, plus 0 and 4 is just 0, so we'll have 10. And then we have 4 times 2, which is 8, and the other two are 0, so we're just going to have the 8, because we'll have minus 3 times 0, 0, 0 times 0 is 0. And finally, going down to the bottom, we'll have the bottom row, and then we'll start with the left again. 1 times 0 gives you 0, 2 times 3 gives you 6, plus 1 times 1 gives you 1, so we'll have 7 in total. 6 plus 1 is 7. Go over to the middle column. 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times minus 2 is minus 4. So minus 4 plus 1 is minus 3. Plus 1 times 4, which is 4. So the minus 3 plus 4, which just gives us 1. And finally, we, then we have 1 times 2, which is 2. Then 2 times 0, 0. 1 times 0, 0. So we'll just have 2. And that is what AB is. And that's the end of part 1. In part two, they ask us to verify that AB is not equal to BA. So basically, we did AB because we had A times B. And now it's saying it was telling us to show that AB is not the same as BA. So basically, we're going to put B first instead of A. So instead of having A, then B, we're going to have B, then A. So instead of writing it all out again, I'm just going to copy it here. I'll get rid of the highlight, though. Um, and I'll take A. So remember... Now we're reversing it. So instead of doing A times B, we're doing B times A. And now we're just going to multiply again and see what happens. So remember, we do the row on the first one times the column on the second one. Um, and that's going to be equal to, and then, so we'll have 1 times, or sorry, 0 times minus 1, which is 0, 1 times 4, which is 4, plus 2 times 1, which is 6. And we actually don't even have to do the full thing. You can do it if you want. But, and you probably should do it, to be honest. But in this particular marking scheme, they accepted that if you just say that one of the entries is different, then that's good enough. So we can see already that the first entry is different. But you should probably go ahead and multiply this all out. But this is enough to sh show that basically you can say top left entry is 6 in BA, but is 2 in BA. A, B, therefore, A, B is not equal to B, A. But again, you should multiply this all out. It's just you didn't have to in this particular one, and I don't need to because I already showed how to multiply a matrix up here. So the next question is horizontal circular motion. So we basically have a bob of mass M. It's on this inextensible string of length L and suspended from a point O makes an angle theta with the vertical and it moves in a horizontal circle. Its center is on the vertical. So basically it's directly under O and the bob has a constant linear speed V. So we're instructed to show the diagram, show on a diagram the forces acting on the bob, which is fairly simple. So we'll just draw the bob. I'll just draw it down here. 
and it has a mass of m. So of course, if we look on the diagram, we can see the string is going to be pulling it up towards the center, and we call that force the tension. Or you can just write T if you want, but I'd always write out the full thing just in case. And then of course, we also have gravity pulling it down, and that force is called the weight, which is always equal to m times g. And that's all the forces. I guess you could say the centripetal force, but that's not really acting on it. The centripetal force is just the tension, because the tension is what's keeping it in the circle. So these are the only two forces acting on the bob. We're then asked to, describe, to derive an expression for v in terms of l, theta, and g, acceleration due to gravity. So basically, um, the first thing we need to do is, when we're talking about horizontal circular motion, there are two main facts we need to use. And the first one is that forces up equals forces down, because obviously it's moving in a horizontal circle, it's not accelerating upwards or downwards. And the second is that the centripetal acceleration is going to be the sum of all the forces in the i direction. So I guess it's sum of forces in the i direction. Or basically, it's going to be the resultant force acting towards the center of the circle. So we'll use this one first. So again, let's just refer to our free body diagram. So we have tension t up here, and we have mg going down. Now this t isn't going straight up, so we'll have to resolve it into two components. So we have this angle theta here. Uh, this is beside the theta, so this will be t cos theta. And here will be t sine theta, because it's opposite. So now we can see the upwards part of the tension is the t cos theta, and the downwards force is mg. Therefore, we must know that t cos theta is equal to mg. Then for fact, so that's fact one. For fact two, um, basically the centripetal force is going to just be acting towards the center of the circle. And since it asks us to derive an expression for V, if you look in your formulae and tables, so on page 51 in the mechanics section, we have that centripetal force here is either m or omega squared, or it's also mv squared over or. Now, since we're looking for V, we're going to use mv squared over or as our centripetal force. So we can just get rid of that. So basically, we're going to say that mv squared over or, which is our centripetal force, now, what's causing it to be pulled into the center of the circle? Well, the only force that's acting towards the center of the circle on the left is t sine theta. So we'll have t sine theta. And then the other fact is that it tells us to find it in terms of L as well. So we have our theta, we have our t, and we have all that. Now, for L, the L is just the length of the string. And basically, the only distance we have in our little kind of equations here is the radius. So we need to get the, instead of writing or for the radius, we want to write that in terms of L. So if you kind of think of our diagram here, if we have the whole thing going down, this is the center of the circle, and then this is the radius, That'll that's the radius, and you can see we have a right angle triangle here, and this length here is L. So if this is the adjacent side, this is the opposite side. So I'll just redraw it down here just so that our diagram doesn't get too messy. So if this side is L and this is theta, well, then the radius here is going to be equal to L times sine theta, because that is opposite. It's not beside the theta. So I'm going to replace that or with L sine theta. We get that mv squared over L sine theta is equal to T sine theta. Now, we can simplify that, but we won't do it just yet. Um, the question doesn't want a T. It doesn't say anything about T, the tension. So what we'll do is we need to replace this T with something, and we can do that using this equation up here our first equation, we say that t equals mg over cos theta. Then we can just sub that into here. So we'll get that the left-hand side stays the same, mv squared over L sine theta equals sine theta times mg over cos theta. And then sine theta over cos theta, that's always going to be tan theta, and we can also cancel out these m's, so I'm just trying to do a bit of simplification. So we'll get v squared over L sine theta equals g tan theta. Then we can just multiply across by L sine theta. We get that v squared equals g L tan theta sine theta. Now, if you kept in, if you didn't change this to tan, that's completely okay as well. If you are at sine squared theta over cos theta, I'm sure that'll be okay, but this is just a nice way of writing it, which means the square root both sides, v equals the square root, and the direction doesn't really matter for this, g L tan theta sine theta. And that's the expression for v in terms of g, theta, and l as required. So l, theta, and g, and we're asked to derive for v. So that's our answer.
In part three, we're asked to derive an expression for t, the period of rotation of the bob in terms of l, theta, and g. So the period basically just means how long it takes to do a full rotation of the circle. So it's going to be a little bit different here. Um, I'm just going to copy uh, these two equations down. So equation one that we had and equation two, I'm just going to copy them and bring them down here because we're going to be using them again. Um, so basically, since we're talking about rotation, it kind of helps to think of, instead of thinking of linear velocity v, it's kind of better if we think in terms of angular velocity. So instead of saying mv squared over r as our centripetal force, I'm going to use the other one, which is in the formula and tables booklet on page 51. I'm going to use m or omega squared, where omega is just the angular uh, velocity. And the reason this is helpful is because we can get rid of some stuff by doing this. So if we're trying to find the period of rotation, well, a full rotation is 2 pi radians, or you could technically say uh, 360 degrees, but in circular motion, we're always working in radians, and uh, they're kind of expected to give your answer in radians as well, because the formula that's even in the log tables has a 2 pi in it. So we're going to be working with radians. So we can do this similar thing again, first of all. Um, we don't want this t again. Well, it says derive an expression for t, the period of rotation, but our t here, that's for tension. So probably should have made that a bit more clear, but oh well. Uh, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say t equals mg over cos theta. And we're just going to sub it into here to get rid of our t. You'll get m or omega squared equals sine theta over, well, it's going to be sine theta times t, which is mg over cos theta. Now we need to do a few other things uh, to simplify. First of all, we can cancel out those m's, of course. And we get that or omega squared equals uh, tan theta, sine theta times cos theta is tan theta times g. Now, of course, we're asked for l theta and g. We don't want this omega squared. So omega just represents angular velocity. So basically, omega tells us how many angles it's doing. Now, I won't use theta. I'll use alpha just because we're already using theta for something else. Alpha over the time. So it's how much angles it's covering in a certain amount of time. And that's also in the formula and tables booklet here, angular velocity, except they're using theta, but we're using theta for something else. So I'm just going to use alpha. Now, if we're looking for a full rotation, the time taken to do uh, the period, which is the full rotation, our alpha, our angle is going to be 2 pi. So basically what we can say is that our omega is going to be equal to 2 pi over t. Now, in our equation, we have omega squared, so we can just square both sides, and we get that omega squared equals 4 pi squared all over t squared. And then we can just sub that back into here, and we should get some nice simplifications. So what we get is or times pi squared, and then we have the 4 as well. I just put it at the front. All over t squared equals g tan theta. Now, there's one more kind of piece of the puzzle we're missing. They don't ask for the radius, they ask for L. So we're going to do the same thing again. And the radius, instead of writing radius, we can write that as L sine theta as the radius in terms of L. So I'm going to replace that or with an L sine theta. So we get 4 or pi squared. Sorry, not or. We're getting rid of the or. We'll have 4 pi squared times L sine theta all over t squared equals g. And now it kind of would have been better if I left this tan theta, but tan theta is the same as sine theta over cos theta. The reason I rewrote it like that is because these sine thetas are going to cancel on both sides. So we can rewrite this as um, 4 pi squared L all over t squared equals g over cos theta. Now we're instructed to find an expression for t, the period of rotation. So we're just going to solve for t here. And I'm just going to do it a bit quickly. I'm going to bring the cos up, bring the g down, and bring the t squared up there. We get the t squared equals, let's the top will say the same, 4 pi squared L. And we'll have over g, and then bring the cos theta up, and we get cos theta. And then finally, we just need to square root both sides. t equals the square root of 4 pi squared L cos theta all over g. And that's technically the answer, but usually we'd write this, we'd factor this 4 pi squared out of the square root, because obviously that's a perfect square. And we'd write it as t equals um, 2 pi times the square root of L cos theta all over g. And that's usually the tr more traditional way of writing it. And that's an expression for the periodic time. And an interesting thing is that on page 54 of the formula in tables, we have this... Um, this formula for the period of a simple pendulum, and it's actually very similar here, except that L there is for the radius, and our radius is just L cos theta, but that's a way you can kind of check. If they ask for period, you can kind of use this formula as well to double check stuff, but it's just good to know that it's there. 
Finally, we're asked to use dimensional analysis to show that the units for your expression are equivalent to the units for period. So period, as we saw, is t, which is time. It's the, how long it takes to do a full rotation. So let's try to show that these units are the same as time. So what we have is we have 2 pi square root L cos theta all over G. Well, sorry, that's very bad theta. Let's go through this. So now I'm going to rewrite this in terms of units. So I guess I might write it like this as units. Um, 2 pi is just a constant, it's just a number. Then we have square root, and the square root does matter. Now L cos theta, remember L cos theta is our radius, so that's in meters over, and then G is our acceleration due to gravity, so that's going to be meters per second squared. So you have meters per second squared, and that's all in the bottom of the fraction. So I guess my favorite way to think about this is if we multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by S squared, we'll get square root of m s squared all over m. Since multiplying the top of this fraction by s squared will give us m s squared, multiplying the bottom of the big fraction will cancel with the s squared on the bottom. Then those two m's cancel. We get the square root of s squared and then the square and the square root cancel, which we get s, which is in fact seconds is the unit for time, which is equal to the unit for time, which is, I guess you could say, the unit for period. And that's the end of question one.